This is the lecture on engine theory, part two. As a jet pilot, you're going to have to pay attention to certain factors that affect how much thrust is produced by the engine, and they're all related to that net thrust formula. First one is engine RPM. If you look at the net thrust formula, where net thrust equals the weight of the air over acceleration due to gravity times V2 minus V1 plus, and let's not worry about the fuel for a moment, the area of the jet times the differential pressure, pressure coming out of the jet minus pressure ambient. If the engine is spinning faster, then that means that we can push more air through the engine. Of course, we can push more fuel through the engine. We can have a higher exit velocity, and we can have a higher pressure in the jet. So all of those, based on the engine spinning faster, would give us more thrust. The uh, aircraft airspeed. If we fly faster, fast enough, in particular, we're going to we're again going to increase the weight of the air coming in the engine. If we increase the weight of the air coming in the engine, we can burn more fuel, we can have a higher exit velocity, burning more fuel will give us a higher pressure in the jet. So flying faster, in general, we can get more thrust. Ambient temperature and pressure altitude both affect how much air, or how many air molecules there are in a cubic foot of air. So if we can suck in a certain amount of cubic feet of air, if the temperature is colder, then the air tends to contract and there'll be more molecules in here. So if it's colder, we can suck in more weight of air. If the pressure altitude is higher, or let, let me try it the other way, if the pressure altitude is lower, we're going to have more air in here. So at sea level, on a cold day is going to be the best place to go because we'll have the lowest pressure altitude or you could say the highest barometric pressure and that'll give us more molecules per cubic inch that we can suck into the engine and if the temperature is colder the gases contract so in it's the same cubic foot of air there'll be more air molecules in it so we can suck in if we're sucking in the same volume we can suck in more air these first two we as the pilot have reasonably direct control over it. We can change the power setting and change the RPM and we can certainly change the forward speed of the airplane. Um, how, what the outside air temperature is or what pressure altitude, we have a lot less control over that. Yes, certainly we could wait until the next day where it's colder and maybe a weather front comes in and changes our pressure altitude, but most of the time it's like, okay, here's the temperature, here's the pressure altitude, can we or can we not go flying? Now, what you're used to doing in a piston-powered airplane is looking up the pressure altitude and into a chart and looking up the outside air temperature and finding a certain spot and going, okay, here's my density altitude. And then you go into another chart with your uh, density altitude and your gross weight of the airplane that you're taking off with and that'll tell you your runway distance for takeoff, runway needed for takeoff. Uh, but in jets, we don't do that. In jets, what we do is we're going to enter with pressure altitude. We're going to enter with outside air temperature. And this one dot that we're going to get, that's going to give us our power setting. And now we're going to take that power setting into another chart. And enter with our gross weight. And that's going to give us the runway that we need. So we're not going to be using density altitude. So for test purposes, the word density will never ever be the best answer on any test or any quiz in this course because I want you to start thinking differently. I want you to think about molecules per cubic inch and that's getting sucked into the engine and that's based on temperature and that's based on pressure altitude. Oh, by the way, 
um, on the on the test or the quiz, if I ask you what four factors do you have to deal with, if you just write the word temperature, I'm going to write in the cabin, and then you're not going to get points. And so if you write RPM, I'll write RPM of the wheels, and then you're not going to get full credit either. you got to tell me that it's the RPM of the engine, that it's the temperature of the air that's coming inside of the airplane. Okay, let's talk about humidity for a moment. If we back up a little bit and we take that uh, piston-powered pist piston engine cylinder, and it's got a piston, and when this piston moves down, air and uh, fuel vapor gets pulled in, and then the valve closes and the piston comes back up. Okay, if it, the atmosphere is 79% nitrogen, uh, correction, it's 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% miscellaneous. Now that's based on the air is being completely dry. If we have completely dry air, that is the relative humidity is zero, then 21% of the gases coming into the engine from the outside air can be oxygen, so we can squirt in a certain amount of fuel. But let's say it's really, really humid. Say it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's 100% relative humidity. So that means it's raining, effectively. Guess what? 9% of the molecules in the atmosphere are H2O. So that's almost 10%. So 9% of the nitrogen is displaced, 9% of the oxygen is displaced. That means of the air, of the molecules getting sucked into the engine, we're going to get 9% less oxygen because it's displaced by water, which means we're going to be able to burn 9% less fuel. So literally, the engine is going to develop 9% less horsepower. So piston engines are affected by the humidity. Now, jet engines, it's a different story. With jet engines, here's our compressor blades and turbines, and we got the combustion chamber. And as I covered in class the other day, this air coming through the engine, only 30% uh, of it is burned up in the combustion chamber. So 30% of the core air is burned. That leaves 70 percent for cooling. Okay, if 70 percent of the air is used for cooling, what that means is that this air coming in, some of it's going to get used up in combustion, but some of it is going to be there to keep the metal from getting too hot, and some of it's going to be there to mix with the combustion process, the combusted air, so that by the time the air hits Oops, I wonder if I can go back. So by the time the air hits, I don't see I can go back, darn it. By the time the air hits the turbines, the air has cooled down. Well, if 70% of the air is for cooling, and we only burn 30%, then you know what we could do? If 9% of the air coming in is water, then we can take that 9% out of the 70, and so we could have 61% of nitrogen and oxygen is used for cooling. We still have 30% of the air left. These three numbers added together still equal 100. And you're going, but Mr. Johnson, we have 9% less air for cooling. Well, guess what? Water vapor actually cools better than the air does. So we don't have to worry about the engine not getting cooled. We still have plenty of vaporous gases, nitrogen, oxygen, and water. We still have 70% of the vaporous, 70% of the molecules coming through the engine are still cooling the engine. But since water cools just as well, in fact, a little bit better than air molecules do, the engine doesn't even notice it. So we can fly through very, very high humidi humidity air, and we still have plenty of air to get burned and plenty of air and water vapor.
to do the cooling. Okay, here's some graphs. I'll let you know which ones I want you to be able to draw. Oh, yeah. And they're out of the Traeger. Um, first one is thrust versus V1 losses. If you look at the net thrust formula, F sub n equals the weight of the air over acceleration due to gravity times the change in velocity, which is V1 minus V2 minus V1, and plus all that other stuff, you'll notice that V1 here, if V1 gets bigger, let's say we have a jet engine. I wonder how many stick diagrams of jet engines I'm going to draw this semester. We got the air coming in the intake, and let's say that we're doing 500 knots true airspeed at altitude, and we're blowing air out at 1,000 knots true airspeed. Okay, the differential, you know, V2 is 1,000 knots, V1 is 500, and of course I'm not doing the conversions. But we're left with a 500 knot differential. Well, what if we were going zero knots? And we could still only get the uh, accelerated gases up to 1,000. Wow, uh, here we have 1,000 minus 500 equals 500 knots to airspeed difference. But if V1 was equal to zero, we'd have 1,000 minus zero equals 1,000 knots to airspeed difference. That would mean that if V1 is equal to zero, then we have more thrust. So as V1 gets bigger, as V1 gets bigger, if that was the only part of the formula here that we worried about, and we said that uh, every other part of the formula stayed constant, and V1 was the only thing that changes, as V1 gets bigger, thrust gets smaller. So here we are. Here's thrust. All of these are going to have thrust. All these charts are going to thrust on the right, going vertical. And this is air, this is, uh, this is V1 effects. So as V1 gets bigger towards the right, then the amount of thrust we can get gets smaller. So here we can make a nice little square. And then this would be really, really easy to draw. Oops, this wasn't the order that I wanted it in. Let's see if I can find the order I wanted in. Here we go. Whoops, no, not yet. I'll show you the one I want here. This is the one I want to show you. All right. This is figure 3-11. You don't have to memorize them by, uh, by numbers. Thrust versus ram effect. Of course, we're going to have thrust. And this, I want, this is ram effect. Let me explain these curves here first. Ram effect. All right. As we fly faster, if we have that that diverging duct, the velocity is going to go down and the static pressure is going to go up. Part of this energy, when we compress air and go to a higher pressure, temperature is going to go up. So if we fly really, really fast, and we have the airspeed coming into the intake is really, really fast, and we run it through a diverging duct, then the pre temperature is going to go up a little bit. Well, if the temperature goes up and the air is allowed to expand, then that means that we're going to have less molecules per cubic inch. If we have less molecules per cubic inch, then the weight of the air is going to be less. So we're actually going to, the faster we go, the faster we go, uh, we're actually going to have a loss of thrust due to the temperature of the air going up. However, the faster we go, the increase the pressure, and the more we're going to shove air into the engine, we're going to get more thrust due to ramming more air into the engine. If we add these two uh, slopes together, we're going to get this resultant one right here. And so this, if you don't draw this one, and you don't draw this one, and you only draw the one here, if you only draw this one right here, this is a resultant ram effect, but only ram effects. Now, i got to go back. Here we go. 
This is the one I want. Whoops. Now this chart, so we've got thrust. And I'm, I'm going to give you a hint. I'm going to ask you to draw this one on the test. If I draw this as a square, because what I'm going to do on the test is I'm going to give you a blank square. And I'm going to say label, draw the graph for thrust versus all airspeed effects. All air speed effects. This line right here, don't draw it, this is the line where you lose thrust due to V1 going up. This is the line that takes into account the ram effects and the temperature going up. If you add this slope up with together with this slope, then you get this line right here. And this is the line that I want you to be able to draw on the test. And I want you to kick, bring this up and it gets steeper, you'll notice. And we're going to say that this is zero. And we're going to say that we're going to do this in Mach. And we're going to say that the end of this square is Mach 1.0. And a little bit past halfway is we're going to say right here is Mach 0 0.6. And what I find interesting is that it's reasonably flat. It starts out and it goes down a little bit because we've got those V1 losses are quite a bit and RAM effect hasn't kicked in pretty good. But then just as you're coming up on Mach 0.6, this increase, due to, increase in thrust due to RAM effect starts going up faster than the loss in V1 goes down. So we finally start getting an increase in, in thrust due to airspeed effects, and it gets faster and faster and faster. This isn't a straight line. It's a logarithmic curve. It gets faster and faster and faster, or correction, we get more. The rate of change is faster. So the closer we get come up against Mach 1, it gets faster and faster. In fact, this thing actually keeps getting steeper past Mach 1. Yay, OK. So on the test, I would probably say, the question would be like this. It would be draw the graph for all airspeed effects versus thrust, label Mach 0, label, label Mach 1, and label Mach 0 0.06. And so it's reasonably flat. It goes down a little tiny bit and then starts coming up at around Mach 0.6. Let's see if I'm, which one of these I missed. Yeah, this one. Here we go. I'm going to ask you to draw this one on the test. Again, this is going to be thrust going vertical. And here we're going to have um, engine RPM. And let's pretend, let's put this in the form of a square. And this will be 0. And we'll say that this is 100%. And you'll notice, when the engine RPM is at 0, the engine thrust is at 0. Somebody always starts drawing the thrust that starts out at a really high level, even though RPM is at 0. If we have 0 engine RPM, we have 0 thrust. And what you'll notice is that through about 50%, this line it doesn't change its steepness very much. But it does definitely get steeper and steeper and steeper. And on the test, I'm going to say label 0, label 90, and label 100% RPM. And you'll notice that the difference here between 90% and 100% RPM is a very large change. You know, if here's total amount of thrust right here, we have like a 20% change in thrust, even though we've only had a 10% change in RPM. What you need to understand here about this chart is that jet engine thrust is not linear with the increase in RPM, especially that last 10 or 20% of RPM. We could come down in here to 80% RPM, and shucks. We're looking at like 50% power, or 50% thrust, even though we're at 80% RPM. So that last little bit towards 100%, we have a huge change in thrust, even though we have a reasonably small change in RPM. So on the test, it's going to be like this. It's gonna, I'm going to say, 
draw, I'll give you the square to draw it in. So practice all your drawing in squares. And I'm going to say draw the graph that shows thrust versus engine RPM, label 0, label 90, and label 100%. And that ought to look something like that. Let's see how many of these others I missed. Okay, let's look at thrust versus colder temperatures. Uh, as we climb up in the sky, it tends to get colder. Oops, wrong one. It tends to get colder. If this was going to be a square, we'd have to bring it up there. Nah, it's pretty close. Now, granted, the reason I this is slightly different than the the uh, what do you call it than the charts in the book because it had it with temperatures getting hotter and the graph would go down. But typically, as we climb up, we get colder. And you notice this is a slight slope. This is like what uh, a four to one slope. It, you got to go across four to get up one. Maybe this is one to five. And we do have some increase in thrust due to colder temperatures, uh, but not a whole lot. But it does help us a little bit. Oops. Let's see where I'm at. Okay. So we got colder temperatures. We did V1 losses. We did engine RPMs. We did all airspeed effects. Here we go. Now you'll notice that compared to the increase in thrust due to climbing and getting to higher temperatures, it was a slight increase up. But you'll notice that thrust compared to climbing to higher pressure altitudes. Now this is based on if you climb to higher pressure altitudes, there was no change in temperature. At that other chart, where it was slightly increasing thrust due to colder temperatures, that was based on no change in pressure altitude. So this is based on no change in temperature. If the temperature stayed the same and you went to where there were higher pressure altitudes, which is really lower static pressure or lower barometric pressure, you'll notice that this is a negative slope. Of course, if you go to where there's less pressure in the atmosphere, there's also less molecules per cubic inch. If there's less molecules per cubic inch, then net thrust is going to be affected negatively. You'll notice that this is much steeper going down than the thrust versus colder temperatures had a steepness going up. So if you combine both of these, if you combine thrust versus pressure altitude, and you combine it with thrust versus colder temperatures, then you would get this chart right here. Whoops. This chart right here. Now you'll notice that it this uh this right here essentially if we had that slow increase in thrust due to temperature and this rapid drop off uh in thrust due to pressure altitudes if we added these two slopes together, we'd get this one right here. But it doesn't go straight forever. You'll notice that it changes at 36,000 feet. And you're probably going, why does it change at 36,000 feet? That's because of the isotherm. When we climb up in altitude, we lose 2 degrees Celsius per 1,000 feet, almost exactly. It's a great rule of thumb. But that only works up to about 36,000 feet on a standard day. We go from 36 to 66,000 feet, and it stays at about minus 56 degrees Celsius on a standard day. So essentially, that increase in thrust due to uh, colder temperatures, it gets flat because it doesn't get cold anymore. So if we added the reduction in thrust due to higher pressure altitudes, that is, less barometric pressure, and the increase in thrust due to colder temperatures, but above 36,000 feet, the temperature doesn't change. If we now added these two slopes together, including this flat spot because of the isotherm, we're going to lose thrust as we climb up in altitude, absolutely, but we're going to lose thrust at a faster rate. The slope will be more negative as we climb above 36,000 feet. Hmm, that's interesting. Transport category jets usually fly between 30 and 40,000 feet. Hmm, it's because if they climb too much farther, they lose thrust faster than before, and they waste more too much fuel trying to get to altitude. So, so if you look at uh, cruise altitude of jets, 
typically they're in the low twenties to high thirties some odd thousand feet. Wow. Very interesting. Now jets are really, really overpowered at sea level. Let's say you want to fly at thirty six thousand feet and you need this much thrust. Guess what? It, you have available at sea level or at zero feet this much thrust. But if this is cruise thrust right here, this might be takeoff thrust right here. Essentially that means that the engine has a lot more power than you're asking out of it for takeoff. Which is true. You typically, if you do not have a computer controlled engine and you are deciding how much fuel to squirt into the engine by moving the throttle, as you push the throttle up, if here's the throttle quadrant looking forward in the airplane and here's the throttle sticking up, you push that throttle forward, you're probably going to stop two-thirds of the way up, 60 or 70 percent of the way up, and that's where you're going to have takeoff power. Now as you climb up in altitude, of course what you're going to do is you're going to pull it back to climb power. Before you get to 36,000 feet, you may not be able to maintain full climb power that you did at sea level, but you're still going to have tons and tons of power. Now, what if you are an airplane? There are some biz jets like a Cessna Citation 10, uh, a Lear, uh, like a Lear 65. There's other airplanes, and they're certificated to 52 thousand feet. Holy mackerel, 52,000 feet. Let's see, if that's 36, this is about 18. So if that's 18, so this is about 10. There's 20, 30, 36, here's 40-ish. And then here's 50. Holy mackerel. If this thing is still going down, and here's 50,000 feet, here's 52,000 feet. Right here. Holy mackerel. If this is what the engine could do at sea level, then we're going to be losing quite a bit of thrust by the time we get to 52,000 feet. So the curve for that airplane that can be certificated at 52,000 feet, it's probably going to look like this. So that even if we're at 52,000 feet, we still have a cruise thrust available even we're at 52,000 feet. The engine at sea level is going to be way overpowered and we may be limiting the uh, the takeoff power, we're probably going to limit the takeoff power to right here, but if we had to we got a whole lot left. And of course there's takeoff, here's max continuous, and then here's climb, and then here's a cruise power setting. Holy mackerel. Jets, if, if we're going to be able to fly at 52,000 feet, we are going to have to be amazingly overpowered at takeoff. All jets are overpowered at takeoff, but if we're going to get all the way up to 52,000 feet, we're going to be amazingly overpowered. Me personally, I think it would be fun to be amazingly overpowered. Okay, this is figure 3-17 and the Traeger. And I'm just going to go over a couple of things kind of fast here. Let's do temperature first. Right here is the compressor. This is the compressor. Right here is the combustor. Right here is the turbine. And then right here is the exhaust. And they did a really terrible job. They didn't even have the intake shown on this jet engine you'll notice that the pressure goes way up and of course that's one of the two things that compressors do one is increased pressure and the other is increased molecules per cubic inch but we as humans haven't figured out how to increase pressure without a corresponding change in temperature so temperature in the combust in the compressor is going to go up a little bit let's use uh, let's use black now let's use blue uh, can't make up my mind. Look at this pressure. Pressure goes up dramatically, but hey, that's one of the jobs of the 
compressor, and if we increase pressure, we're also going to be able to increase molecules per cubic inch. You notice the velocity doesn't change very much. You notice the temperature doesn't change a whole lot, but we have this huge change in pressure. Then when we get into the combustion chamber, that's the whole point. We're going to have a uh, fuel nozzle right here squirting in fuel and burning right here. So wow, check this out. The temperature climbs dramatically. Holy mackerel. So we have this amazing change in temperature in the combustion chamber or in the combustor. And what that allows us to do is have a really, really big increase in velocity. This velocity goes up. Essentially, what we're trying to do is increase the kinetic energy of the gases. Then right in here, and we're going to get to it when I get into turbines, is a set of stationary blades. Before it goes into the first rotating blade, we're going to have a couple of stationary blades. I can't draw this very well. And what you'll notice is that the the area across here and the area across there has changed. As the air goes through these stationary blades, the velocity is going to go up, static pressure is going to go down. So this rise in pressure right here, which is a huge rise, is because it's going through some stationary blades that are essentially like sticking your thumb across a water hose and bringing the velocity up. And then this turbine blade in here is going to get hit with this really, really high velocity gas, hit it, and it's going to slow it down. So then you can see that the pressure or the, the velocity goes way down. And then it's going to hit another set of stationary blades that kicks the velocity up and another set of rotating blades. So you'll notice that the average velocity keeps going down. OK, so the other thing in the combustion chamber that I wanted to show you here was that the velocity goes up and the static pressure changes very, very little. And we're going to say that the pressure remains relatively constant, does not go up much, does not go down much inside of the combustion chamber. And if you notice, here's our velocity entering the engine. Here's our velocity exiting the engine. Here's our pressure entering the engine. And this engine doesn't have really very, it's only a little bit higher than the entry pressure. Now this happens to be a turboprop, so it had extra turbines in it. So if it didn't have those extra turbines in it, the velocity would be higher and the pressure would be higher. But we're trying to extract the energy to drive a shaft, which it doesn't show, and drive an output uh, to drive a propeller. So inside of the compressor, pressure goes way up, temperature goes up a little. Inside of the combustion chamber, pressure doesn't change much, but because of this increase in temperature, we have a huge change in velocity. OK, let's see. Um, OK, we're going to talk about the atmosphere and some things that apply to jet engines. If we are at sea level, We'll just go sea level, which is the same as zero, and 18,000 feet, and 36,000 feet. Um, just for fun, we'll do 42,000 feet, and then 66,000 feet. The static pressure goes down at a rule of thumb, at about one inch of mercury per thousand feet to about 15,000 feet. If we uh, lost one inch of mercury, if we started out at 29.92 and we went to 29,920 feet, you'd think, OK, fine, we have zero inches of mercury pressure. But that would mean the space shuttle could orbit at 30,000 feet. So this rule of thumb isn't perfect. In fact, at, at 15,000 feet, it's not one inch. It's really about 0.8 inches. But as a rule of thumb for takeoff airports, if we go up 1,000 feet, then we can. that means that we can subtract one inch of mercury from the atmospheric pressure. So on a standard day at sea level, if it's 29.92 inches of mercury, and we're at a 5,000 foot density altitude, oh, correction, pressure altitude airport, then that barometric pressure, or 
outside would be 24.92 inches of mercury. And in fact, if you look at a manifold pressure gauge of an airplane that has a constant speed propeller, and you're at 5,000 feet pressure altitude, and it's a standard day, 29.92 inches of mercury, then the manifold pressure gauge would read about 24.92. So there's that rule of thumb to 15,000 feet. feel like a kid erasing a, an Etch-a-Sketch board. Yeah, well, I feel like a kid most of the time anyway. That way I can eat Trix cereal because Trix are for kids. Do they still have Trix cereal? Okay, enough playing. So at sea level, the atmospheric pressure is 29.92 inches of mercury and that's the same as 14.73 uh, pounds per square inch and as we covered you may have heard before that you notice the ratio of here is about 2 to 1 in fact it's really really close to 2 to 1 and of course the higher we go up the less atmospheric pressure there is if we also look at temperatures standard day temperature is 15 degrees Celsius, and we're not going to worry about Fahrenheit. And as we go up in altitude, it goes down about 2 degrees Celsius for every 18 that for every thousand feet. So 15, 18, uh, 15 degrees minus 18 times 2 is 36. We're already into the negative numbers at 36,000 feet. Interestingly enough, it's minus. 56 degrees Celsius at 42,000 feet. It's minus. 56 degrees Celsius and this isotherm goes up to about 66,000 feet so it's minus 56 degrees Celsius so what we've got here is this isotherm it's one word isotherm iso meaning one and therm meaning temperature or heat so it doesn't change well if we go to colder and colder temperatures we're going to where the speed of sound is less at sea level, correction, at 15 degrees Celsius, the uh, speed of sound is 662 knots indicated airspeed, which is also knots true airspeed. So the fast, so in this case, they're the same. So that equals 662 knots true airspeed. As we go up to 36,000 feet and the temperature gets colder, it's 574. Yeah, let's see, let's put it somewhere else. It's 574 knots to airspeed, but indicated as less. Interestingly enough, at 42,000 feet, it's 574 knots to airspeed, and it's half of that uh, indicated and whatever half of that is. See, half of 500 is 250, half of 70, 70 is 35, and half of 4 is 2. So we're looking at 287 knots indicated airspeed is 574. And this isn't exactly perfect because we've got some compressibility issues. But we can fly a slow indicated airspeed and have a really nice high true airspeed. Interestingly enough, I love this 42,000 feet. It's really at 42,000 feet knots equivalent airspeed equals knots true airspeed over 2 at 40,000 feet. And if we didn't have compressibility effects, then this would be knots indicated airspeed. So that's what's so special about 42. What's special about 36 and 66 is we've got this isotherm. Temperature keeps getting colder by 2 degrees Celsius per 1,000 feet until we get to 36,000 feet. And then, of course, this is on a standard day. We've got this isotherm. So now the speed of sound, so down here, this is Mach 1. Or I guess we could put this at the top. So Mach, whoops, hit the wrong button. So Mach 1 here, okay, I keep hitting the wrong button. So Mach 1 here, in not, in, uh, from 
56 to minus minus 56 to minus 56 from 36 to 66. Since it's the same temperature, Mach 1 stays the same. 574 knots true all the way up, including at 66,000 feet. But the difference between true airspeed and equivalent airspeed gets different as we climb up because, of course, we have different pressure altitudes and different temperatures. You've got to take into account uh, between indicated and true or equivalent and true. You've got to take into account pressure altitude and you've got to take into account temperature. So the, one of the so one of the rather interesting things is that drag is directly related to equivalent airspeed. If we were doing 287 knots equivalent airspeed down here, we'd still be doing 287 knots true airspeed. But up here, if we're doing 287 knots equivalent, we're doing 574 knots true. If we don't take into account the wind, we could double our speed, even though we're only double our speed across the ground, even though we're still flying the same equivalent airspeed. If we're flying the same equivalent airspeed, then we have the same drag. Drag is directly related to equivalent airspeed. So the higher we go, the higher we go for the same equivalent airspeed, we have the same drag, but for the same true airspeed, drag is less. So if we have the same equivalent airspeed and the same drag, we could have the same thrust, but the faster we go, the faster across the ground we're going to go. So if we're a jet airplane, we don't want to fly below 10,000 feet anyway because there's a 250 knots indicated airspeed restriction because all those bug smashers down there. So we don't want to fly low because the bug smashers are down there and it's too easy to hit them. We want to fly high because for the same equivalent airspeed and the same drag and the same thrust, we can fly a much faster true airspeed and therefore cover more miles per pound miles per thrust, which is the same as miles per pound of fuel. So we're going to be a lot happier on how much fuel we burn versus how many miles we cover if we go up to where we have the same amount of drag but our true airspeed is much, much faster. Interestingly enough, I got another altitude here, 64,000 feet. That's the Armstrong line. And this will win you some bar bets. The Armstrong line was not named after Neil Armstrong. I don't know who it was named after. But interestingly enough, at sea level, the boiling point of water is 212 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the same as 100 degrees Celsius. But as we go up to where there's less pressure, you know, if we've got a pot of water and we're heating it up, uh, how much pressure is pushing on the water is going to determine how easy the water molecules can escape in a vaporous state. So if we, excuse me, if we have less pressure, then the water molecules can escape easier without as much energy, that is, at a lower temperature. So as we go up in altitude, the temperature of water boiling gets less. When we get to 64,000 feet, water boils at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit which is 37 degrees Celsius, and I find that rather interesting because at this temperature, that happens to be the typical temperature of the human body. So if we're above 64,000 feet, let's just say we're at 80,000 feet in our SR-71, and the boiling temperature of our water is 85 degrees Fahrenheit, if we expose our body to the outside pressure, the water in our body is at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and so the water in our body is going to start trying to turn into a vapor. And when water goes from a liquid to a vapor, it expands. If we start with one liter of water and we boil it all off into water vapor, we're going to end up with 1,700 liters of water vapor. There is a ratio. I know this is pretty wild. There's an increase in volume or an expansion ratio of 1 to 1,700 when water goes from a liquid form into a vaporous form. So what do you think is going to happen to the liquid water in your body when it's trying to turn into a vapor? It's going to expand like a massy Ferguson tractor. So if you're going to fly above 64,000 feet, I recommend that in addition to having a pressurized cabin, that you also wear a pressure suit, a space suit, and keep it closed so in case the cabin depressurizes, uh, you'll still be at a high enough pressure that your water liquid in your body doesn't try to uh, turn into a vapor and expand like crazy. Thermal efficiency is the ability to change the fuel energy 
into thrust. So this is essentially uh, the efficiency of the inside of the engine. How well is that engine burning fuel inside the combustion chamber and getting a high velocity out of here? Or of course we could put in more turbines and run a propeller or a fan and that of course is going to give us thrust too but it's all about the engine it's all about the engine so that's why it's called eternal internal efficiency because it doesn't take into anything into account except how much fuel you're burning and how much thrust you're making now you can have higher thermal efficiencies from two different ways of course we've already talked about the fact that if you have higher pressure in the combustion chamber inside of the combustor if we have this compressor and it puts in pre uh, air at a really, really high pressure, we can extract more energy out of the fuel. So certainly that will improve our internal efficiency, that will improve our thermal efficiency, and of course higher, higher uh, thermal efficiency is the same as lower TSFC, because lower TSFC means better fuel economy. So there's actually an inverse ratio. I think that's on the next one. Hey, inverse ratio. Yep. Um, so that one we've gone over, but here, higher combustion temperatures. I'll tell you what I mean. Higher combustion temperatures. I guess I'm going to have to draw you a picture. Okay. If we have the inside of a turbine engine, let's not worry about what kind of whether it's a turbojet or a turbofan. You got to remember, 70% of the core air is used for cooling. That means 70% of this pressure in here is blowing air through the engine just to keep the engine cool. Well, you know what? If we could allow higher combustion temperatures because we made turbines out of something that could withstand higher and higher temperatures, then we could blow less air through the engine. We could say, you know what? Let's cut off some of this uh, compressor. We don't need as much air. Let's just say that we only need 50 percent of the air going through the core for cooling and now we don't need this much of the compressor we can have a smaller compressor that means the turbine blades don't have to extract as much energy to drive the compressor so we can either get more thrust if it was a turbo jet or if we had extra turbines instead of this turbine driving this big compressor that energy could go to a bigger propeller or a bigger fan and get more thrust because literally the this turbine section you know generically 66 percent of the energy that, that all the turbines extract is to drive the compressor but if the compressor is smaller then this could be say 60 percent of the energy and that extra six percent could be given to the propeller or the fan or be allowed to blow out the tailpipe so if we can have higher combustion chain higher combustion temperatures and hit the turbine blades at higher temperatures then we can spend more of our fuel on developing thrust through a fan, a prop, or blowing out the tailpipe. And if, of course, if we had a turbo shaft engine, we'd be able to get more shaft horsepower to the propeller instead of having to use the shaft horsepower to spin a big compressor. And of course, I already mentioned that high thermal efficiency. is really good and that's the same as lower TSFC because low TSFC is lower fuel flows per amount of thrust and of course here's thrust over fuel flow another kind of efficiency is propulsive efficiency instead of being able to turn fuel into thrust this is if you're developing thrust how fast can you go with it I'll give you an, uh, an example here Let's say we have two identical airplanes. We'll see if I can draw identical airplanes. I'm going to have to take a class on how to draw airplanes. And let's say that we put a turbojet on this one. And we take the exact same engine core, put a couple extra turbines in it, and we make it drive a big fan. It's got the extra turbines in it. But the engine inside, the core engine, is still the same if the forward speed of these two airplanes we'll just say is 500 knots true airspeed and the air coming out of the this uh, turbojet 
is doing a thousand knots then our propulsive efficiency of this engine and airplane combination is 500 over a thousand the forward airspeed of the airplane in knots divided by you know uh, the velocity of the air coming out the tailpipe which could also be I think I've got it down here where is it yeah there it is true airspeed over V2 um, but if we looked at the entire average airflow coming out the tailpipe and coming out the bypass, then maybe this is only doing 750 knots. Because remember, the bypass fan, it's going to get its thrust from develop changing a large mass and only having a small change in velocity. So it only changed the velocity 250 knots on average, so the V is small. So now the th the propulsive efficiency of this smaller airplane is 500 over 750, and that and here this propulsive efficiency is 0.5, and here let's see that goes into there two thirds, so that'd be 0.67. So this airplane, even though they're going the same exact speed, even though each engine core was identical, since the velocity of the gases that we accelerate are closer 750 is closer to 500 than 1000 is close to 500 so the propulsive efficiency is higher if we took another airplane exact same airplane and we put a turboprop on it we put a propeller on it and it has an even higher bypass ratio than the turbofan does and its average velocity coming out the tailpipe and the propeller was 600 knots then the propulsive efficiency of this airplane would be f and engine combination would be 500 over 600 and that's even bigger than 0.67 let's see what is that that's going to be like 0.8 or something like that ish ish is that an aviation term 0.8 ish in any case we're still doing 500 knots although that's pretty fast for a turboprop um, if we could get these numbers, it would have an even higher propulsive efficiency. And effectively, we're going to get a higher propulsive efficiency whenever the average accelerated gases of the entire engine, including the fan or, and or the propeller, and when that speed is closest to the forward speed of the engine, then, pro high, then propulsive efficiency is going to be highest since propulsive efficiency takes into account the airspeed of the airframe something external to the engine then it's going to be called so be called an external efficiency because you have to take into account how fast are the gases leaving the engine including the prop or the fan versus how fast are the gases uh, or how fast is the forward speed of the airplane so which engine is going to have the highest propulsive efficiency the one with the highest bypass ratio that would be a turboprop because you're not changing the velocity very much, the true airspeed of the airplane versus the accelerated gases, including the fan or the prop, are going to be the closest together. And of course, if we can travel, if we have, we already talked about the fact that if we have high bypass ratios, we can get higher uh, fuel efficiencies because we don't have to uh, use as much fuel to get the same amount of kinetic energy. Brayton cycle. If you talk about the four-stroke engine on piston engines, uh, it's called the Otto cycle. O-T-T-O -T -T -O is named after some guy named Otto. I think that was his last name. The Brayton cycle is talking about the cycle that is in airplanes, correction, in jet engines, and that's where the pressure is reasonably constant. So in a piston engine, the pressure goes up and down every time you open the valves, or the, comp the piston goes up or goes down, or the fuel catches on fire. The pressure is, is, is changing all the time. In a turbine engine, the pressure inside of the combustion chamber doesn't change very much. So we're going to call that a relatively constant pressure cycle, and the name of that is the Brayton cycle. Of course, the Bernoulli, Bernoulli's theorem, we're always talking about velocity goes up, pressure goes down. That's really just an example of how to apply Bernoulli's theorem. If we have, you know, the, the classic uh, Venturi Bernoulli's theorem is saying that energy total right here is equal to energy total right here is equal to energy total 
right here, Bernoulli's theorem states that in a closed energy system, we're not adding any energy and we're not extracting any energy. We're not letting any air out of the system and we're not letting air any into the system. That is from this point here forward. We don't add or subtract energy. We don't let any air in or out. Then that means that at any given point inside of this closed system, the total energy is the same. Well, if we constrict, you notice right here, right here, and right here, we're constricting this duct. That's going to force the velocity go to go up. But since Bernoulli's law says that right here has to be the same energy it is right here, if we increase the dynamic energy, then that means we're going to have to decrease some other type of energy. And so that's why the static pressure goes down. When we have a con uh, diverging duct, here, uh, from this point right here to this point right here, the duct is getting bigger. That's a diverging duct. We're going to allow the, the, the velocity to go down. The axial velocity is going to get less. So in order to keep total energy be the same, if dynamic, dynamic energy goes down, then static energy is going to have to go up. So if somebody says Bernoulli's, what's Bernoulli's theorem? Bernoulli's theorem is not talking about velocity and pressure. Bernoulli's theorem is talking about the fact that anywhere in the system, the total energy is equal to any other point in this closed energy system, and that if we affect any one type of energy, positively or negatively, then, the, then at least one or more of the other types of energies are going to be affected in the opposite direction. Mach versus temperature. If you took 309 or 310, you probably came across this before. I mentioned it on the previous slide. Mach in the atmosphere is only changed due to the temperature. It is not affected by the, I hate to use the word density, it is not affected by the number of molecules per cubic inch. It is not affected by the pressure. It's only affected by the temperature. So we have a jet engine. I'm going to back this up a little. Oops. I want to draw a big picture. If I want to have a big picture, here, now I have a nice blank screen here. Let's say we got our jet engine and we're flying along. And here's air coming in the intake, and we're going to exhaust it out. And here's V1, here's V2. And let's say that the forward speed of the airplane is 500 knots true airspeed. And let's say we're at altitude, so above 36,000 feet, so that means Mach 1 is 574 knots true airspeed. Whoops. Okay, so we're doing, you know, 574 over 500. Let's just say that's about 0.8 Mach. That's V1. Now, we got to blow something out the tailpipe faster than it's coming in the intake, otherwise the airplane will slow down. So if we wanted to maintain a constant speed, let's say here's our jet. Man, i got a really lousy jet. So here's our engine blowing tailpipe out. Let's say we're doing 500 knots to airspeed, and we're blowing 1,000 knots to airspeed out the tailpipe. We need a higher exhaust velocity than the forward speed of the airplane because we have to overcome drag. If it was, if we were doing 500 knots and we were blowing air out the back at 500 knots, drag would start slowing us down. So we're going to have to, to overcome drag, blow out air out the engine at a faster velocity than we're going just to maintain a constant airspeed, to maintain a constant altitude. So V2 is always going to have to be V1 if we're maintaining a constant speed. Now, we're going to burn fuel inside of this engine like crazy. We're going to burn fuel and hot gases are going to go out the tailpipe. Now inside of that uh, burning combustion process, it might be 2,000 degrees Celsius, but of course we're going to have some cooling air. You know, we're going to have this air come in here and mix with the combustion air. Let's see if I can find a nice one. So the air is going to cool down a little bit before it leaves, before it enters the turbine section. So probably hitting the turbine section is going to be about 1,000 degrees Celsius. And the turbines are going to extract a little bit of energy. So I'm making these numbers up, but let's just say it's 900 degrees Celsius. Whoops, not 9,000. 900 degrees Celsius leaving the engine. Well, 
guess what? If we're 900 degrees Celsius, you know, if here's sea level at 15 degrees Celsius and the speed of sound is 662 knots true and at 36,000 feet it's minus 56 degrees Celsius and the speed of sound is 574, this is, this is plus 15. What if we go to plus 900 degrees Celsius? This number is getting bigger as we go to hotter temperatures. So we're going to end up, and I'm just making this number up, let's just say for fun that at 900 degrees Celsius the speed of sound is 1500 knots, true airspeed. Well that means that if we're blowing air out the tailpipe at 900 degrees Celsius, Mach 1, right inside of here, right inside the tailpipe, Mach 1.0 equals 1500 knots to airspeed, but we're blowing air out the tailpipe at a thousand knots, so if we're blowing air out at a thousand knots to airspeed, that means that a thousand knots, when the speed of sound is 1500, then we're only doing 0.67 Mach inside the tailpipe, yet the forward speed of the airplane is 0.8 Mach. And that's entirely because even though we're blowing air out faster than 662. We're blowing air out faster than 574. We're certainly blowing air out faster than 500. It's still below the speed of sound, the local speed of sound inside the engine, because the speed of sound inside of the engine, in this case the exhaust, Mach 1 is really, really high because the temperature is really, really high. So we can actually have, coming into the engine, 0.8 Mach, the forward speed of the airplane is 0.8 Mach. Be doing 500 knots true, blow air out the tailpipe at 1,000 knots true airspeed. But this 1,000 knots true airspeed, because it's inside of this hot engine, is really only Mach 0.67. If you have any questions about that, come to me. Let's see if I got that. Yeah, okay. Oh, one more thing. Oops. Speed of sound inside of the engine in addition to the exhaust. If you look at the temperatures in here, these velocities in here may be, if we're blowing, uh, blowing uh, a thousand knots out the tailpipe, we might have 1500 knots true airspeed inside of between the combustion chamber and the turbines but since the temperature in here is really really hot you know it's hotter than 900 so the speed of sound right in here might be 2000 knots true airspeed so if we have airspeed in there at 1500 knots we're still less than Mach 1 so from if it's this this is a subsonic engine coming in the intake going through the entire engine and leaving the tailpipe it's always going to be less than Mach 1.0. Although we're going to go way faster than 662 knots or 574 knots, wherever we happen to be, the velocity will go way higher than that. But since we have really high temperatures, Mach 1 goes way up, and so we're not ever going to exceed it. So if we're in a subsonic airplane, an airplane that's going subsonic, the velocity from the beginning of the engine to the end of the engine is always going to be less than Mach 1 but certainly some of the speeds are going to be higher than 662. If you have any questions about this section, you all need to know how to get a hold of me. Please ask. If you have any improvements as to how this lecture went, please let me know. I would enjoy hearing about them. Thank you.